uh, spray? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to pray, but I will, are you ready for it with your prayer? Of course, ma'am. Okay, that's good. Okay, so... Wait a second. Okay, not yet, not yet. <laughs> okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to our program. So I'm Marmalin Marpaung, as you know, will be your moderator for this program. And thank you for joining us for those who's just not with our class. So welcome to our program, Experience the Cultural Diversity in collaboration with Cross-Cultural Understanding Subject. Before we start, Uh, let's having a prayer. So we are going to So Kathleen si tomorrow will lead us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your blessing until this beautiful time we can get together here. We want to start our lesson about culture. Please get best, best us so that we can understand about what, to, what uh, we can learn today. Please bless our speaker so that he can tell about culture as well please help bless our parents our friends so that we always healthy thank you god in the name of jesus we pray amen thank you kathleen so Can you hear me? Yes, sir. So today's topic, uh, and then for next Thursday, will be about intercultural communication, general values, uh, ways of life, do's and don'ts, and dating across culture. And then the topic will be divided into two. Uh, Sir Hibbert will, uh, go, is going to talk about intercultural communication and general values for today. All right, so we are going to finish our program at 3 p.m. Jakarta time. And we'll have question and answer section at the end. So you need to prepare your call questions. You do not need to drop your questions on the chat box. You can ask directly to the speaker. Is that okay, sir? That's fine. <laughs> so now I'm going to introduce our speaker today, Sir Garth Hibbert. That's quite hard to pronounce his name. <laughs> I do remember when we got uh, pronunciation. Uh, pronunciation class. <laughs> if we can pronounce his name, we can pass the subject. <laughs> so, Sir Hibbert will be our speaker for today and next Thursday. And then I know I have known Sir Hibbert since 1998. He was our head of English department and my lecturer back then when I was at university. We used to call him Sir Ibe. <laughs> 
So actually, for your information, he's our favorite lecturer back then. <laughs> <laughs> so he's actually British citizenship, but he lives in California now with his family. And he will talk about himself later. So welcome, Sir Hibbert. Thank you for being with us today. I know it's quite late in Cali. Okay. <laughs> really appreciate your time. No problem. I can get so, up late. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sir Hibbert, the time is yours. Thank you so much, Marlene. What an honor it is for me to have this opportunity to, to share a few words with your, your class about culture and intercultural or oh, yeah, intercultural understanding or communication. Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, maybe first, okay? Um, just to to break the ice and uh, to introduce myself to 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 the class. Um, now you're going to have to tell me what I should do, Marlene. Um, I'm going to go to my screen just for a moment, share screen, and tell me if you can see my, okay. Um, oh dear. I may have to go out just a second. Um, just hold on, I have to get my, my PowerPoint working again. Nope. It's okay. Really? Just, just a minute. I... All right, let me try again. Hopefully it'll work this time. Okay, do you see my slide? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Okay. All right. As Marlene has mentioned that my name is Garth Hibbert. And I'm just wondering if Marlene remembers what the K is for, stands for. Kevin? <laughs> hey, well done. <laughs> uh, you have a good memory. <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, okay, and give you some um, personal background. Uh, what I think you say in Indonesian, you say kalau tidak dikenal, tidak disayang, or whatever. I think that's how you say it. So let me introduce myself a little bit more. As Marlene mentioned, I am a British citizen, but I have never ever lived in England for a long period of time. Okay. I was born and I grew up in Africa, in South Africa. And um, so I spent uh, the first 24 years of my life, more or less, give or take a couple of years uh, in, in Africa. And um, of course I was born to, to British parents. Um, so that is why I have British citizenship because my father was from England. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my family. Um, I have a sister who lives in Canada, and I have a brother, a, a younger brother, younger sister who lives in Canada, younger brother who lives in um, in England and in London actually. And then I have um, a, an older brother who moved back to South Africa from from England uh, a year ago. Um, I'm married to a very beautiful lady 
um, she's uh, close. She's actually um, um, Indonesian, and uh, she comes from Manado. So um, I had the I had the privilege of working in Manado, as Marlene knows very well. Uh, I spent um, 20 years of my life at uh, UNCLUB. And those were, I would say, you know, I would say maybe the best years of, of my, of my uh, work experience. Um, I worked in Africa for, for one year in Central Africa in the country of Zaire as a teacher. And I worked, as I said, I, actually I taught at UNAI for two years. Um, I taught English and I also taught education um, for two years and that's where I met my wife. And uh, maybe our next session, you'll hear a little bit more about dating cross-culturally. And uh, I have a lot of experience in that regard. Um, so, as I said, I spent a total of 23 years in Indonesia. And um, I loved every moment of it. And Indonesia is so close to my heart. And I cannot, um, I cannot, uh, you know, with family, and I'm just so tied and close to to, in, to, to Indonesia, to Manado. In fact, I have property in Manado. Um, and then I spent three years uh, as a principal of, a, of Lakpahana Adventist College and Seminary in um, Sri Lanka. And I, um, I spent five and a half years as the director of an English language school in Vietnam. And then I spent three years in Thailand as the vice president uh, for student administration at uh, Asia Pacific International University. Um, and now I'm semi-retired here in California. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in arts and education and I have a master's degree in uh, education, in curriculum and instruction. I also have a second master's degree in teaching English as a second language. And then I have an educational specialist degree in curriculum and instruction. So that's a little bit about me. And uh, I have three sons. Um, my oldest son is Andrew. And he is married, uh, married to a an Ameri Korean American, and I have one grandson, whose name is Michael, and I have a second son who is Gavin, and um, my sons grew up at in Indonesia. They grew up at um, Unclub, and um, Gavin is working here in the United States, and. Uh, my third son, Robert, is just finishing his um, undergraduate studies, and he will graduate this June. So that's a little bit about me and um, uh, my family. Okay. Now I also want to say a few words about Professor Marlene. Um, you know, Marlene has a very um, special place, I think, in my heart. Um, she is one of the students who I remember very well. You know, you don't always remember all students, do you? You know, I mean, you, you see them, but then they change and, you know, time goes by. But, you know, Marlene kind of is um, changed. She hasn't changed. She's ever young and um, still looks just like she used to look. And I remember very well. Why, I think I was trying to think, why do I remember Marlene so well? And I think that um, the reason is that she was so active as a student. She was always involved in things and always participating in things. And so I think that's what sticks out in my mind 
about Marlene as a very active student, always engaged and always doing things. Um, and then the other thing that I remember about Marlene is she was always happy. She was always smiling. And, you know, I, I, I remember that about her and, I, you know, it's, it's, it was special. And this occasion for me is very, very special, you know, to, to have the opportunity to be a part of my student who is now a teacher, to be a part of their class. It is just a special, a special experience, a special event for me. And, um, I would like to thank her for giving me this opportunity to, to share a little bit um, uh, with her students, you know, about uh, culture and cross-cultural understanding, because this is actually the class that, one of the classes that I taught her way back uh, in, the, in the dark ages. Um, and, uh, I don't remember all that I taught, of course. In fact, I was planning to go back and look at my curriculum because I still have it on my computer, you know, but it's not on my computer, it's on a, it's on a disc. So I, I need to get everything. And in fact, in fact, I was going to look for some photos of Marlene back then too. I'm sure I'll be able to find some. Okay, well, that's enough about that. Thank you again, Marlene. It's, a, it's really wonderful to be able to have this opportunity. Um, as Marlene mentioned, the topics that we're going to look at are intercultural communication. And I basically divided that into two. What is culture and what is communication in order to understand what international, intercultural communication is. And then general cultural values. We're going to just look at two major theories. Um, the one is Hofstede's uh, six dimensions, values. And then Cluckhorn and uh, Strudbeck value orientations theory. You may have already studied these in your cross-cultural um, understanding class. I don't know. But if you have, it'll be kind of like a review for you, right? And um, if not, it'll be something new. And um, you can hopefully learn something from that. And then, of course, three and four and five are ways of life, do's and don'ts, and dating across cultures. And I think we will probably save those for next time we meet. Okay, all right. So the, the, the question that we, we have to answer if we want to know what intercultural communication is, is what is culture, right? And I'm sure if I ask you to, to share with me your understanding of culture that each one of you will be able to at least tell me a little bit about what culture is for you, right? Um, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm just going to go through these points. And then if, at the end, if we have time, you can ask me questions, be happy to answer them. One thing that we must always remember that culture is dynamic, it changes. And you do not see the changes um, over a short period of time. But if you continue to observe culture over a long period of time, you will see how it does change. And I was saying to Marlene at the beginning that I have seen how Indonesian culture has changed uh, over the last 40 years, the years that I've been uh, involved with Indonesian culture. And uh, of course, it's a shared experience, right? Culture is a shared experience. It's a group, OK? It's a group. And of course, individuals are part of the group. It's not uniform and it's not rigid, it's fluid. And um, not everybody in a culture has exactly the same values, has exactly the same experience, all right? Um, even though, of course, there are certain generalities. And we know that culture is passed down from one generation to the next. It's passed down consciously and unconsciously, right? Um, you learn it from your parents, you learn it from your society, from the, the people around you. And um, culture is all about patterns of meaning. And these can be symbols, it can be many things, how they interconnect and form a unit, a culture. And of course, 
culture helps us, it helps us to understand the ideas and the behaviors of other people who belong to a different cultural group. Okay, so that's just a little overview of, of a simple overview of what culture is. You all have a culture, you're all part of a culture. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Um, theorists have referred to four layers of culture. Okay. These are the four basic layers of culture. And um, the first layer, of course, is what we call human universal. So these things are common to all people all over the world. All human beings share these common core, these human universals. Okay, some of the things that you can read there are um, language, institutions, values, uh, learning and development, the need for relationships, beliefs, myths, all of those kinds of things are universal. Every culture has those things and every culture uh, addresses those, uh, those universal um, dimensions, okay? So that's the bottom, right? That's the bottom. And then you have um, the second layer, all right? The second layer are those specific worldviews that the largest cultural unit in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a country, you might say, uh, or the, that people identify as their, as their own, okay? Now, it, it's, it's often a national culture, right? In, if we look at Indonesia, what is the largest national cultural group in Indonesia? Of course, it's Indonesian, right? That is the most, that is the national culture. The national culture is Indonesian. And Indonesian have many common things that everybody, doesn't matter if you're from Anada, from Sumatra, from Java, you have these things in common. Okay, so that's your national unit. But then there's another layer above that, and it involves the reality that while we are part of a national unit, we can also be part of a subculture, right? And I'm sure that you're all part of a subculture, okay, in, 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 in Indonesia. Um, and your subculture, for example, it may be Javanese, all right, is not exactly the same as Manadanese, right? There are differences in your, in your culture. So you are part of a subculture. And then on the top, we have the fourth layer, which is unique to individuals within the culture. It could be subculture or national culture. And how individuals apply the cultural guidelines, okay? Because individuals don't all, they're not homogenous, they don't all experience culture the same way, even though they're part of that national cultural group or that subcultural group. Um, individuals interact with culture in different ways and according to their unique backgrounds, contexts, ideals, and abilities. We're gonna look at some of these things and what they look like, okay? And I've had many experiences that, you know, that have revealed this to me um, in my life. Okay, so that is a little bit about um, culture, okay? But what about communication? What is communication? What is it? Well, Let's look at some basics. This, these are very basics, okay? Communication. To exist as a human being on this earth means to communicate. You cannot not communicate, right? Even a baby communicates. Um, and what is the goal? The goal of communication. The goal of communication is to inform and persuade. When you communicate with somebody, you're informing, you're persuading them. Okay, you know what persuading is, yeah? Uh, what is that in Indonesian? Bujuk, right? I think. Okay, if I remember correctly. And um, for sure, 
um, communication is very complex. It is so complex. And people have courses and majors in just communication, okay? That process, you know the process is the, the encoding of information, the decoding of information, um, and there are interference, right? There's noise that comes in that kind of uh, uh, impacts how you understand something, um, and there are different ways that we communicate. It's very complex. Um, communication takes place through more than one channel, right? We have verbal communication, we have oral commun I mean, uh, uh, written communication, we have um, uh, nonverbal communication, right? So many ways. Just a little wink of your eye can mean something, right? You're communicating something. Yeah, a little smile can communicate something. These are all ways that we communicate messages. And these messages can be enhanced, but sometimes can also be um, inhibited, right? They can be contradictory. It's very complex. And uh, it's no different with intercultural communication. So I want to, let's look at the last one there. The last point there is very important, okay? The foundational, um, the foundational consideration for all effective communi uh, communication, intercultural communication should be what? Listen, what can I do to build trust on the part of my audience? Okay, I'm gonna take us, I'm gonna pause for a while and kind of unpack that a little bit because for me, this is very important, okay? Foundational to, to, to effective communication, it not only intercultural, but any communication really, is what can I do to build trust on the part of my, my audience, okay? All right, so um, I like this, this last point, all right? Okay, what can I do to build trust? How do you build trust in your audience so that your communication with somebody of another culture can go well, okay? Um, and so what I'm gonna share with you in the next few minutes will, I hope will help answer this question, okay? What can I do to build trust in my audience, okay? Um, let me just, uh, I'm, I'm afraid to go out of my PowerPoint because I may not, Get it right again, you know. So I'm just gonna leave. Can you see me okay? You can see me okay, Marlene? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Um, so um, you and I, we come from different cultures, right? We come from different cultures. Um, but you know, you and I share a subculture. Okay, even though we come from different places, um, and I do understand your culture very, very well, okay, um, in spite of that, you and I have something that we share in common. And in other words, um, our, your culture and my culture, they intersect and interconnect in a, in a dramatic way, actually. What is that that we have in common? Anybody think about it? What is it? It's one of those universals, okay? But it's a common value. All right, that is our worldview, our worldview. So you and I share a worldview. What is that worldview? I don't know for sure, but I think most of you here are Christians, right? Okay, 
And um, we share this with each other. It's part of a subculture that we share. And um, if you, as a Christian, right? If you are a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you have an even deeper connection, right? A deeper commonality with me, all right? And um, so as a Christian teacher, teaching mostly Christian students at a Christian university, I want to interject into our discussion here at this point um, our shared theological or Christian basis for intercultural communication. Okay. So see if you can identify with me in what I'm going to share with you now. Okay. See if you can identify with me because I'm going to talk about our, our worldview just briefly. I'm, I'm, I'm integrating faith and learning here a little bit. Okay. So I want you to think carefully about this because I think it's essential. Um, okay. Our culturally shared theological or Christian basis for intercultural communication. This is what I believe it is. Okay. I believe that human beings are created in the image of God. Do you believe that? Most most Christians do, right? Especially Seventh-day Adventist Christians, right? And therefore, we are what? Communicative by nature. It's in our nature to be communicative. Okay. The second thing is God communicates himself and his will to mankind. And mankind responds to God, right? Is that what you believe? I think so. I think you do. Yeah, as, as, as Christians. The third thing there, mankind, not only God communicates with man, but mankind communicates with God, right? Through prayer, right? And God responds, right? How does God respond to mankind? How does God communicate with mankind? Through his sacred, revealed sacred scriptures, right? The Bible. How about answered prayer, right? And circumstances, right? God brings about circumstances. We believe that. And also our consciences, right? God communicates with us through our conscience. Swarahati, right? And um, then the, re the revealed, this is very important. The revealed essence of God is what? Love. Is that right? God is love, right? You agree with that, right? And the revealed duty, your duty, my duty as human beings, is to love and obey God. Is that all? No. There's another part to it, right? And to love fellow human beings in the same way. Does that encapsulate your um, worldview? Is, that part, is this part of your worldview? Is it part of your subculture? I think so. I think so. It's part of mine. So we share something in common, don't we? We share something in common. Even though we are very different, right? I look different from you. You look different from me, right? But we share something that is very important. Um, so, our theological basis provides us a simple fundamental principle for intercultural communication. And what is it? This is it. God is love, and he desires that we respond to him in love as we become ever more loving and lovable people, okay? I want you to think back to the question that we asked earlier. How can I win the trust of my audience, right? 
in international communication, right? I believe that being a loving and lovable person will go a long way to building trust in your audience as you engage in intercultural communication. I don't have, we don't have time to unpack what love is, right? But I think you all know how the Bible describes love, love to God, love to our fellow man. If you remember what, 1 Corinthians 13, right? The love chapter, it tells us what love looks like. Now, why do we say loving and lovable? In other words, you communicate lovingly to other people, but you must also be a lovable person, right? If you're not a lovable person, communication is going to break down, right? There's going to be a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of breakdowns. If you're lovable, there will still be breakdowns. But you know what? The breakdowns, you will be able to discover the solution or you'll be able to understand them in time. But if you're unlovable, it's unlikely that you are going to have a positive intercultural communication exchange. This has been my experience. Um, and I believe that I have been able to cross cultures, to communicate with people of different cultures. And I believe that at the basis of my success has been this principle, loving and lovable, loving and lovable. So um, without this trait, without this loving and lovable uh, trait, your cross-cultural knowledge for the most part, will just be cold and ineffective. You may know all about differences in culture, but if you don't have this, these traits, um, it'll be cold, it'll be formalistic, and it'll be largely ineffective. Now, I'm looking at this from a Christian perspective, right? It doesn't mean that other people cannot also be loving and lovable who are not Christians. Okay, I'm not, I'm not implying that at all. But if they do, they will be more successful too, right? They will be more successful too. Okay. Um, so, let's see if we can find a definition here. This is my definition, okay, of intercultural communication. Intercultural communication is the cultural intelligence we use as we try to meaningfully interact with and understand people from other cultures, okay? You're trying to develop what? A cultural intelligence, right? A cultural intelligence that will enable you to cross boundaries, cross cultures, and understand people. Okay. Um, I'd like to just share with you, Marlene, this is, if you're interested, um, there are, I, I read two books in preparation for my, you know, for this class. Um, and I, I wanted to take a Christian, a, a Christian perspective, okay, on intercultural communication. There are many books written um, from the secular perspective, okay, and they're good. There's no problem with those. But I wanted to see, you know, have a, a, a Christian perspective. And these are two books that, um, that present uh, intercultural communication from a Christian perspective. Uh, of course, they, they also have a missiological uh, emphasis, but that's okay too. Uh, but there's a lot in them that will be of beneficial. You might want them for your library or something like that. Um, okay. Um, I want you to think of a time when you engaged um, in intercultural communication. Have you ever had interco intercultural communication with, with somebody from another um, 
culture? What was your experience like? Probably you observed some similarities, but many differences, right? Many differences. And between yourself and, and that person. Now, noticing the differences is the easy part, right? It's easy to see the differences. But it is more difficult to understand the meaning behind those differences. Why? Okay. So uh, why is it difficult to, to understand the behavior of other people? from other cultures, right? Well, it all boils down, or largely boils down to difference in values, right? Difference in values. So in order to understand the differences in, in culture, we need to understand the deeper level of cultural value systems. And um, these value systems are, are vital or essential to how a culture expresses itself. So this is where we are moving now into general cultural values, okay? All right. So what are cultural values? They are deeply held values that serve as guiding principles that determine cultural perceptions and behaviors, okay? So these are those deeply held values that guide the culture, right? Guide your thinking, guide your behaviors, guide your perceptions. And um, they form, they, they form customs, right? Your customs, your traditions, they guide behaviors, and they shape your attitudes. They shape your attitudes. And we use these values to make judgment, to pass judgment on whether Certain things, certain ideas are right or wrong, are good or bad, are important or not important, are desirable or undesirable, right? Can you see how important it is to understand these values? Or at least to understand the values of another culture that you are trying to communicate with? Okay. <clears throat> All right. How do we get cultural values? We've already learned how we learn culture, right? The same way. You know, we learn them by being taught them and subconsciously. Okay. And they're often you, they're often hidden in language and traditions. Okay. All right. And as I mentioned, children learn them. Parents teach them to the children, teachers teach them to the children, and um, also the larger community teaches traditions and values, okay? So that's where we get them from. All right, now we're going to look at two theories, or yeah, you could say ways of categorizing um, values okay ways of categorizing values in a culture okay and the first one that we're going to look at is um a a um, paradigm that was put forward by a person by the name of geert hofstede okay and this is he did this if i remember correctly in the 70s okay and he was a dutchman and he uh, conducted his, he's, a, he's a, what, a, a social scientist. And he conducted his, this, his, his experiment or his, his, on cultural uh, differences at IBM and a very big company in those days. And he came up with six dimensions, six dimensions that, um, help us to understand the differences in values, in different cultures, okay? There's the individualism, collectivism dimension. There's a power distance dimension. There's an uncertainty avoidance dimension, masculinity, femininity dimension, long, short 
term, term orientation. And number six, indulgence and uh, restraint dimension. Okay, so he categorized these six dimensions, all right? Let's take a look at them and see what we can learn from his um, categorization of values. Okay, so here we have the values, individualism and versus or as opposed to collectivism, all right? Um, You know, it's important before we get into these to, rem to, to understand that we're dealing with two, uh, uh, two ends all right, on a continuum. What is a continuum in Indonesian? Uh, like a number line, you know, like a garis, right? And... Um, on one end is individualism, and the other end is collectivism. But in the middle, in between, you have different degrees of each of these, right? Okay, so it's not one culture is like this, and another culture is totally like that. No, no, no. Cultures tend toward one or the other, okay? They tend toward one or the other, okay? And um, so what does individualism look like, individualism look like, okay? It's a tendency, what, to prioritize oneself and one's immediate family and friends, okay? Maybe you're thinking, well, that's selfish, right? But I want you to get that uh, thought and take it captive for a while because we're not talking about selfish here, okay? We're talking about how cultures value things, right? And so in an individualistic culture, people are more centered on one's self or one's immediate family or immediate, immediate friends. And, um, uh, so what are some of the value, oh, sorry, what are some of the value traits, the major value traits of an individualistic culture, okay? An individual right to self-determination, and children learn to be assertive and distinctive, all right? So in other words, in that culture, it is so important, all right, that people learn to determine their own destiny, okay? Uh, and that children learn to assert themselves, not to be passive, right? And they want to distinguish themselves. They want to stand out, okay? And they, of course, as I mentioned, they prioritize their own personal goals, right? Their own goals. Um, and uh, individuals, therefore, in this individual cultures are responsible for their own success or failure, okay? So you cannot connect your failure or your success to somebody else very easily. You are the master of your fate, right? The master of your destiny. You're going to be successful. You're going to fail. Okay. And then some of the things that are, are um, the words that we use are initiating alone. So you you use initiative. Um, what is that in Indonesian? I, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Um, but usaha sendiri, you know, um, uh, and then I, I wrote you sweating alone, but sweating alone means to strive, right? But usaha, right? To, to strive, and then um, you achieve alone, and you win what? Applause, right? You win applause. So these are. These are some of the, the traits that you find in, in, in individualistic cultures, okay? And what drives the success? What drives these individualistic cultures? Competition, right? Competition is what drives these, these um, uh, individualistic cultures. So 
Think of your culture. What kind of culture do you have? Where, I mean, where on this continuum would your culture be? You don't have to tell me now. You don't have to. Um, American culture is very definitely on the individualism side. Okay? Very definitely. Okay. So what about collective cultures? Collectivism. So collectivism, uh, cultures that are collective, um, describe society in a tightly integrated uh, unit, right? The relationships, they are very close and there are many in-groups in these cultures, okay? And the loyalty, support for each other in the group is very highly valued, okay? So in other words, it's collective and not individualistic. And what does it look like? Well, you put the needs and interests of the group above your personal uh, desires or motivations or your individual desires and motivations. Um, and of course, children are taught to what? To be obedient, to conform, right? and to be respectful, to be respectful, okay? Now that doesn't mean that individualistic cultures are not respectful, but they are in a different way, all right? Whereas collective cultures, that is very important to show respect, okay? So again, I wonder, where do you stand? What is your culture? Where do you fit in? Uh, Please remember that no culture is completely one or the other, okay? There are always elements, and uh, different cultures exhibit differences, and some may be a little bit more like one, a little bit more like the other. And these values are difficult to change, okay? These values are very difficult to change. Not impossible, but difficult, difficult to change. Now we come to the second dimension. This is a power distance dimension, okay? What do we mean? What does it look like? Okay, those that in a large power distance culture, okay? large power distance culture, except that the boss is higher, okay? And he deserves more formal respect and has more authority, okay, the boss. And generally, People are more accepting of um, relationships where there are submission, okay, or even serving those in authority. Um, so those who are subordinates in this uh, dimension, all right, um, generally expect to be told what to do. You have to tell when they don't take initiative and they don't speak their minds they don't tell what they feel inside unless maybe somebody in authority asks them okay and generally they will not challenge a decision they will not provide an alternative or give input unless of course it's asked of them and um, so they also will probably be much less likely to challenge a decision that is made okay even though even though you think that your perspective or your your position is better okay and in this dimension uh they must accept a a decision okay and even though you may know that it's it's maybe is a, a, a big problem, but you don't say anything about it, okay? Because there's a large power distance, okay? And sometimes the the uh, the um, uh, traits or the, the status, age, status, 
or seniority are very important in these uh, social relationships uh, in large power distance cultures. Okay. All right. So now we move to small power distance cultures. What do they look like? Um, superiors and subordinates are more likely to see each other as equal in power. Okay. Um, the sense of equality leads to the idea that all people are the same standing or importance. And therefore, what is the result? There's less formality, more informal um, communication, right? And, um, and then also there is inform informality um, in speech, in dress, in manners that other cultures may find difficult to understand because they contradict what they know to be their values. Okay. Um, so thinking about power distance, where do you think your culture is? Small power distance or large power distance? Oh, America? How about America? Mm. What would you say? Well, America is kind of like, uh, it's not on the end. It's more toward the middle, leaning or tending toward uh, small power. Okay. Um, so different cultures you will find on different um, uh, points on the continuum, okay? All right, so number three, the third point, the third dimension is uncertainty avoidance. What is that? <laughs> Basically, this is risk-taking. Are you a risk-taker or not? Yeah, Do you take risks. Okay, so those who have weak uncertainty avoidance those cultures, they show more acceptance of, I'm sorry, I'm back up, I think I skipped something. Here we go, strong, strong uncertainty avoidance. What do they look like? So they generally want to avoid conflict and competition, okay? They tend to appreciate very clear instructions. Instructions must be clear and they dislike ambiguity. What is ambiguity? Something that could be like this, could be like this, what is it, right? They want clearly defined rules and rituals in completing a task. Um, stability and what is known are preferred to instability and the unknown in strong uncertainty avoidance cultures, okay? This is an interesting one for you. In educational settings, okay? Countries with strong uncertainty avoidance expect their teachers to be what? Experts with all the answers, right? Marlene, I don't know if you experience this, right? A teacher cannot be wrong. <laughs> the teacher must know everything and must be like a Kamus Berjalan, right? Or Encyclopedia Berjalan. <laughs> and... Um, and that's just one way of uh, valuing a culture. And this is a strong uncertainty avoidance culture. Okay, so what about a weak uncertainty avoidance? What does that look like? So they show more acceptance of differing thoughts, ideas, and are more highly tolerant of uncertainty. Okay, less regulations, more ambiguity, and the environment is more free-flowing. What about in the educational situation for teachers? Okay. So in a weak avoidance, a weak uncertainty avoidance country, it's okay if the teacher says, I don't know. I don't know, right? Is it okay for you if the teacher says, I don't know? I don't know either. <laughs> well, I hope that if your teacher says, I don't know, 
she won't put a full stop there and say, or a period and say, oh, that's it, right? Your teacher will say, I don't know, but I'll find out for you, right? <laughs> that will be better, right? Okay, so now we move to the fourth, right? The fourth um, orientation. Um, this is called masculinity and femininity. Don't be confused by these words, okay? Um, uh, basically, it's how we make decisions, style, style of our decisions. So what does a feminine value culture look like? Okay. Um, what are feminine values here? What is meant by feminine values? Okay. A concern for all, an emphasis on the quality of life, an emphasis on relationships, right? We, right or wrong, I don't know, this was... A, done quite a long time ago, and I'm sure if he was doing it today, he'd probably choose different words maybe, but nevertheless, this is what we have, right? So the feminine qualities or the feminine of life are, yeah, we, the gentle, gentler things and uh, relationships are more important. Um, gender roles are fluid, okay? I think I've skipped something. Let me, did I? Yeah, I'm doing feminine first, okay? We'll go back to masculine, okay? Um, gender roles are fluid, okay? Uh, not so much talking about what we today know as gen gender fluidity, okay? <laughs> I, I, I think you understand. I don't know if you do understand what I'm talking about when I talk about gender. Today, gender fluidity has a very different understanding because today, in today's culture, modern culture, uh, there are not just two genders, right? Right? I believe there are two genders, but there are many in society today who believe that there are more than two genders, right? And nevertheless, um, in countries that are more feminine in their values, when women become leaders, uh, political leaders, business leaders, and there are fewer obstacles to women in the fields of science, technology, um, engineering, mathematics, okay? And it's okay for men to stay at home, to be a house, dad, house husband, right? Uh, it's okay. And it's okay for men to, to do those typical those occupations that we maybe typically associate with women or um, females. And then feminine cultures typically um, offer generous paid maternity and paternity leave, free health care, free access to higher education. These are some of the things that we see in a predominantly feminine culture. All right. What does a masculine culture then look like? Of course, you will know it's the opposite, right? Yeah. So traditionally in a masculine culture or masculine values, what are they? Assertiveness, right? Materialism, getting, 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 and less concern for others, right? And in a masculine oriented culture, gender roles are usually clearly defined, right? Men are the breadwinners, right? And women take care of the domestic duties, okay? And then men tend to be more focused on performance, ambition, and materialism, or material things. Men have to be tough, right? And in um, uh, um, what is it? I lost my place here just a minute. Um, independent, right? Tough and independent. While women cultivate modesty and quality of life. So here we see two contrasting cultural dimensions. The values of masculinity, femininity. What is Indonesian culture? You think about it and you answer that question, right? Okay. All right. So what is the next one? 
number five, right? Long term and short versus short term orientation. What is long term orientation? Well, long term orientation values persistence, perseverance, and thriftiness. What do those mean, right? Persistence, you do it over and over, right? Perseverance, it's a synonym. You don't give up. You don't give up. Don't give up, right? Thriftiness, you're not what? Wasteful, right? You're not wasteful. Tira boros, right? You're careful how you, you, you use things. You're economical. And uh, long-term orientation is often most marked by relationship orders based on age and status, right? So it's very important. Your grandfather or your father or whatever, very important. And there's a strong sense of shame, shame, both personal and for the family and even the community. And not only for your, in your immediate uh, community, but across generations, right? Across generations. And then um, what an individual um, does reflects on the family. What you do reflects on your father's name, on your family's name, and is carried by immediate and extended family members, okay? So this has to do with long-term uh, orientation. What about a short-term orientation? What does it mean? Short-term orientation values tradition only to the extent that it fulfills a social obligation. Oh, I have to do this. I have to give a gift at Christmas time. I have to give a gift on a birthday, right? So, okay, you value. But that's it. It's not over a long period of time. And um, there's an emphasis on personal representation, how you present yourself and honor, your honor, and a reflection of your identity and your personal integrity, as apart from that of the family or the extended family or even the community. Um, personal stability and consistency are also valued in short-term oriented cultures, contributing to an overall sense of predictability and fam familiarity. So these cultures uh, are more likely to focus on the immediate short-term impact of some issue rather than think of it generationally or in the long term. Okay. Uh, is Indonesian short-term or long-term orientation? Was it a mixture of both? I'll let you answer that question, okay? Let you answer the question. America is relatively short-term, has a relatively short-term orientation. All right. Um, the next one is the last one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, number six. Indulgence versus restraint. So high indulgence rating, what do these cultures look like? They allow relatively free gratification of basic natural human desires related to enjoying life, having fun, okay? And they tend to place a higher importance on leisure and tend to act, um, so oops, sorry and tend to act and uh, spend money as they please. So what is the, um, what is the uh, saying for that guy? Uh, eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow, you die, right? That kind of thing, right? Not so concerned with the, the long term. Live for the now, be happy, enjoy, you know, enjoy life. Um, what about low indulgence uh, or restraint? Okay, cultures that have more restraint, low indulgence. They have strict social norms, right? You cannot just do whatever you want, right? You got to think of what your 
neighbors will say, what other people will say. Citizens are more likely to feel a little bit powerless as if their experiences are not determined by their own actions, but rather situations happen to them. Okay. So in other words, they're not so in control of what they can do and what they cannot do. Even though they may want to do something, society prevents them from, from indulging in that. And there's often more police force and the maintaining of national order and high is a high priority in restraint cultures that are more restraint, uh, have more restraint. Okay. Um, so what is Indonesian? I think this is an easy one for you to answer, right? I think so. Um, America tends to be more on the indulgence side um, or high indulgence. And generally, uh, Indonesia has been more on the restrictive, right? Restrictive or restraint. Okay. Now, remember, we're not talking about morals here. We're not talking about good and bad, right? We're not talking about right and wrong. We're talking about where people, where cultures place on in these, in the continuum on these um, different dimensions. Okay, so this brings us to the end of Hofstede. And where are we in time here? Marlene, how are we doing? Do we still have, how many more minutes do we have, Marlene? Can you help me? It's about 45 minutes more. Okay, great. Okay. So we want to look at one more value system, okay, or theory. Okay. So the first one we looked at was what? Hofstede's six dimensions for understanding cultural values. Okay. Why cultures have the things they have uh, or do the things they do. Um, and now we're going to look at a different one. This is the Kluckholm Strodbeck value orientations theory. And um, this represents one of the earliest efforts to develop a cross cultural uh, theory of values. According to Kluckholm and Strodbeck, every culture faces the same basic survival needs, right? What are these needs? Maybe these are like the human universals, right? and must answer the same universal questions. And it is out of this need that cultural values arise. So in other words, different cultures face problems, right? Face issues, have needs. And the way they deal with these needs, the way they address these needs, okay, brings about the values that they hold precious or they um, value, okay? The values they value, right? And um, the basic question faced by people everywhere falls into five categories, okay? And each of, or five problems, you might say. And each of these problems have three possible responses. Okay, or three possible solutions or orientations to each of these, these concerns, these problems. Okay, you got the picture? All right, five categories, five problems. Each problem has three possible solutions. And by looking at these, we can understand a little bit more about the value system of a culture. Okay, all right, what is the first one? What is the inherent nature of human beings? All right. Now, in answering this question, all right, you will determine the values of that group, that culture puts on it. Okay. So, are human beings inherently evil? Are they basically good? 
or are they mixed? Are they both good or evil, potential good, evil, all right? So how are you going to answer these questions? The way you answer these questions is going to determine how you value things, right? If you say that human beings are inherently evil, what might you see in a group that adopts this position, right? Well, you probably will see what? A emphasis on what? Law and order, right? Law and order is very important. And keeping people from doing wrong, protecting people, strong measures to keep people from the impulse, you know, to do, to do wrong, because we're basically evil, right? Basically good. Some people believe that, okay, that we're good, basically good. And uh, that we're progressing, huh? that man will become better and better and better, right? And then other people feel, well, we're a mixture of both. We're good, we're evil, mixture of both. So where do you stand? What is What value do you have here? Interesting. As a Christian, where do you position yourself in terms of your religious values? Most of us as Protestants believe that man is inherently what? Evil, right? Sinful, right? Because we're sinful. Because of the fall, when Adam and Eve fell into sin, what happened to our nature? The human nature became sinful, right? And we have no power within ourselves to do good. Right? Do good, in other words, to save ourselves, right? And that is why we say we are, uh, by nature, evil. But is there good in people? Of course there's good in people, right? Of course there's good in people. Okay, so that is the first question that, that they ask in order to understand human or cultural values. Okay, the second question is, what is the relationship between human beings and the natural world? Nature. How do you relate to nature? A, submission. All right, so in other words, nature is control, nature is dominant. We cannot control nature, we cannot change nature, Nature is going to do what's going to do. Therefore, we must learn to accept it. Okay? B, the problem or the solution or the way of looking at this is to control nature or master it, right? In other words, don't allow, do what you can to control it. If there's floods, what do you do? You build walls or you build dams or you, because you want to control nature, right? Even nowadays, if there's a drought, what do they do? They seed the clouds, right? With chemicals so that it can produce rain. The third one there, or the third way of, uh, Solving this is harmony, being in harmony with nature. In other words, try to be an extension of nature rather than submitting to it or controlling it, okay? You see this sometimes in Japanese art or in Japanese, um, uh, uh, what do you call, landscaping, right? They like to be in harmony with nature, especially in the Buddhist world. I don't know if you've been to Buddhist uh, monasteries. They are very, very peaceful places. 
and they try to integrate harmoniously with nature. So where do you stand? What is your position? How does your values, how are your values reflected in your choice? As a Christian, where do you stand? Uh, maybe you could stand in different, maybe in all three, you know, somewhat. What did uh, God tell Adam and Eve to do after they sinned and were sent out of the Garden of Eden? They told them to what? To work the work the land, right? And subdue, subdue nature. Um, but perhaps there's some values. Um, that we can, in the responses, all three of them, in uh, in cultures, right? But maybe one is dominant. What would be dominant in a in a in American culture? Of course, I think it would be to control, to control nature, right? We want to control the floods. We want to control the the tornadoes or whatever. You know, want to you want to be able to master. Okay, so that's the second question. What about the third question? What is the best way to think about time? Right? How do we think about time? Um, some societies are rooted in the past and uh, believe that people should learn from history and, str and, and we want to strive to preserve the traditions of the past. Okay. Other societies place more value on the here and now, believing that people should live fully in the present. And then others are more future oriented and such societies, they place a great value on the future, believing people should always delay immediate satisfaction while they plan and work to make a better future, right? So, where does your culture position itself uh, in finding a solution to this problem, the problem of time? Okay. Answering these questions will help you understand what a culture values. Okay. Number four, how do people relate to each other? socially okay so is it hier hierarchical with an emphasis on um, deferring to higher authority or authorities within a group or is it as equals emphasis on consensus within an extended group of equals. What comes to mind when I say that is how Manadunese, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure maybe Indonesians as a whole also have this, I don't know. Marlene, maybe you can help me. Um, I know in, in, in Manado they like to have what they call mushawara, you know, where people come together and then they talk about the issues and then finally as they talk, 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 a consensus is comes to the surface. And then that is what people say, okay, that's what we will do. Right? That's what we will do. Yeah. So there's a there's a collateral, there's a you know a group um, approach. And then of course there's individualistic, the emphasis on individuals or fa individual families within a group who make decisions independently of other people, right? So it doesn't matter what society is saying so much, what the community says, if you want to do this, you do this, right? So I, I hope that you can see some of these overlap with the um, uh, 
the dimensions that we looked at in the um, Hofstede uh, orientation. Okay. All right. Then the last one is what is the proper mode of human activity or the motivation? Huh? Is it being? Oops, sorry. Is it being? Is that what you value? In other words, no need to strive for something important. Just be who you are. Just be, you know, just be. Accept the way things are. Just be. Or is it becoming? Okay. In a becoming society, um, life is regarded as a process that's continually unfolding. Our purpose on earth people might say, is to become fully human, is to become better and better and better. Okay. But you cannot do it suddenly. It's a process. Okay. Where you are in a certain point, that's okay. That's up, up to you. You know. Um, and then the last one is doing. Those societies that are primarily uh, uh, oriented to doing are people who think that if you're not, if you're inactive, you're wasting your life, right? So people are more likely to express the view that we're here to work hard and that your human worth is measured by your accomplishments, what you accomplish. That is what determines whether you have been successful or not, okay? So that is another way of approaching this problem in life problem of how do we look at human activity, all right? How do people view it? What is the motivation? Okay. All right. So these are uh, five problems or needs that every culture has and every culture must answer and every culture will answer these in different ways. One of these three ways, maybe more than one of these three ways, but that's a way to look at the different uh, cultural uh, values. Okay, so I want to spend the last few minutes that we have together um, looking at these uh, analyses that we've, we've made, okay? These two ways of analyzing uh, cultural values and um, point out some of the shortcomings, perhaps, in these different uh, paradigms or these different uh, theories. Okay. Um, when we when we look at these, uh, I told you before that. When we looked at the dimensions value dimensions, we said that there, these are two extremes and then they're on a continuum, right? And you can be placed within, uh, within, within this, the two ends, like book ends, if you want to look at it like that. Um, but what is the big problem with this? Um, most research, if you go back to the layers of of, of, of uh, culture. Most research takes place in the second and the third layer, okay? In the national culture or the subcultures. That's where most social scientists do their research. But not much research or in the past has been done what? On individuals in a culture, right? So it is very useful to describe the general cultural traditions of and patterns of behavior that you find in a specific culture. However, these can also be very problematic when applied to individuals. Let me give you an example of this, okay? Um, while I was working in Thailand, um, one of my uh, subordinates, uh, expressed herself in a certain way 
that surprised me. Okay. Because I know that the Thai people are very respectful of hierarchy, age, seniority, and the monarchy. You know what the monarchy is, right? The king. And Thailand has some very strict laws. You cannot say anything bad about the king. If you do, you can end up where? You can end up in prison, right? And um, I always, always strive to be very respectful of, of the monarchy, of the royal family. Uh, but I was so surprised one day when I heard my subordinate, yeah, colleague, if you want to say, not really colleague, but my subordinate, uh, talking in a way that was very dismissive and derogatory toward the monarch, toward the king. And I thought, wow, it, it was like, huh? it was like a shock to me to hear this individual express thoughts that were what? Counter culture, right? Counter culture. This is, this is not what Thai should be doing. This is not what Thai people should be saying. This is not in harmony with the general cultural value that the, na the national value that they ascribe to. And I realized that it's um, unwise to take general cultural traits and try to put them on every individual that comes from that culture, right? Because it will not work, okay? Because individual identities in today's world tend to be very complex, okay? And they are constructed from a variety of sources. Okay. Individuals may belong to an ethnic group, okay, or national group whose worldview, values, and behavior are quite different from those represented by the mainstream culture. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? So while these paradigms of um, uh, theories of um, cultural values are good because they provide generalities, ways we can talk about cultures, we must be very, very careful of putting everybody or lumping everybody into one homogenous group. Okay. Because it's not it's not like that in reality. I think you can, can you, can you understand what I'm saying? Can you think of yourself? Imagine me, right? I'm a British citizen. I am definitely not culturally 100% British. Yeah. I come from so many places. I've been exposed to so many cultures. I always try to take the good and leave the bad, you know. Wherever I go, I adopt what I like about a culture and I make it my own, okay? Now, maybe some people say that's cultural appropriation, you know. I don't care. I think that's good, right? It's good. Uh, I know I will never be Indonesian, right? I can never be Indonesian, right? but I can for sure take many, many, many beautiful things from Indonesian culture and incorporate them into my personal culture, right? To my culture, what makes me different. And, you know, um, it's so important for us to understand this. Political boundaries do not define who you are. Because you, uh, you are encompassed 
it, or you, you are surrounded by the boundaries of Indonesia, uh, it doesn't define who you are. Okay. And uh, one might consider that in regard to groups which cross, uh, sorry, especially in regard to uh, cross political boundaries, right? In fact, um, today there is um, uh, a lot of what we call um, interculturalness or cross cultural. Uh, activities, okay, and borders are not, or much more porous. Yep, people are crossing borders all the time, and um, why has this happened? What has caused this change? Can you think of anything that has caused this change? Well, one thing that causes this change, maybe not so much in Indonesia, but in many other countries especially European countries, America, is migration. Yeah, migration. Widespread migration, both legal and illegal. All right? Slowly but surely, it impacts upon a cultural group. Okay? Another thing that has impacted um, the... Uh, fluid cultural, uh, cultural uh, traits that we find in many individuals in, in different culture is globalization. Globalization in uh, education. Marlene went to Australia, right? And I'm sure in Australia, you were exposed to many different kinds of values, right? Some you may have liked, some you didn't like, some you maybe took, others you left, you know, uh, but it changed you, right? You were not the same person culturally after spending years in Australia. You cannot be. You, it, something from the Australian culture must have rubbed off on you. Yeah. Um, travel, right? Travel. Travel is so easy nowadays not now during COVID time but prior to COVID time right and business people are working in different cult countries many Indonesians are working in other countries in Southeast Asia especially um, and um, another thing that has brought about this uh, fluidity in individual cultures is the internet, right, and social media. Now we are exposed to different cultures all the time. Every time we put on, uh, or we go to YouTube, or we go to the internet, um, you are expo being exposed to different cultures. So these cult, these differences, or these ex experiences, um, sometimes subconsciously begin a change in us, all right, begin a change in us. And then, of course, we, we don't want to forget another thing that changes cultures sometimes, especially individual cultures, right? Individuals, people within a cultural group that makes them different from other people in that cultural group is intercultural relations, marriages, right? Intercultural marriages becoming more and more and more popular today, common, I should say, more and more common. When I got married, uh, long ago, it wasn't that that common, yeah, for uh, cross-cultural uh, marriages. And maybe I'll tell you some stories about that next time we meet. Right? I'll tell you my experience at your school. All right, your school. Um, and that was uh, forty odd years ago. Um, okay, so. We must be careful, right, when using these culturally defined um, values or defined cultural value categories because uh, they present people's individual behavior as entirely defined or limited by 
the category itself. What do we call that? Stereotyping, right? Stereotyping. Stereotyping is when you take a characteristic of your cultural group, of, of a cultural group, and then you apply it to everyone that comes from that cultural group. Okay? That is called stereotyping. And it, while understanding generalities about a cultural group is good, we can never take those generalities and apply them to individuals within that group. You cannot assume, right, that everyone in that group is like that. If you do, you're stereotyping, and that is not something that we should do, right? Um, because stereotyping can have dangerous consequences, all right? It can lead to cultural conflict. It can also lead to racism, all right? And uh, we need to avoid that uh, carefully. Another one is essentialism. What is essentialism? Um, basically, it is when you ascribe categories to a person from a culture that are the, that are the essence. In other words, uh, they are natural characteristics and they cannot change. See, in other words, that's the essence of that person. See, that value is the essence of that person and they cannot change it, all right? Very dangerous. Very dangerous to do that. Yeah. Another problem with these theories and these categories is what we call reductionism. So in other words, you, you reduce the culture down to its smallest elements, right? And then you say, oh, these elements define a person. That is very dangerous, right? Because we are not the sum total of our parts, okay? The part doesn't, how can I say, it doesn't determine who you are, okay? Um, and uh, we do not want to try to reduce things to the smallest thing, smallest element and then say, oh, that uh, is what a person is like. Um, I've already spoken about um, the problem with these theories is that it often does not denies individual freedom, individual freedom, right? Or the, the, the free will, the free will to choose, to choose whether to accept, to be part of that or to have that value or not to accept that value, okay? And then another problem with these um, theories is they tend sometimes to be uh, presented from a Western perspective, okay, a Western perspective. And while I, I, I believe that the, the researchers were, were genuine and honest in their, their uh, um, research and their the determination of categories, sometimes um, some of the categories can have negative connotations or, or may, or negative connotations may be attached to those uh, specific, specific values, okay? Which obviously was not the intent of the researcher, but sometimes um, unconsciously this happens. So we think, oh, in other words, oh, that person is hardworking, therefore he's good, you know. Or that person is laid back. Oh, they're not good, right? You understand? So we do not want to. We do not want to do that. We don't want to moralize uh, our um, the way we we form our perceptions of of uh, different. This is important that we don't do this. So. In conclusion, okay, um, 
what can we do? All right, so as far as possible, we should allow other cultures to define themselves. Of course, it is good to be aware of conventional cultural descriptions, as we see in these different uh, uh, theories. Okay, But when you encounter somebody from a different culture, put them aside. Put them aside as far as possible and focus on the individual. Focus on the individual from that culture. And uh, you will find that that identity of that person may be very com complex and may come from a variety of influences and may be different from the generally held uh, characteristic of that culture. Okay, So we must avoid the cultural stereotypes and, re and remove preconceived assumptions. So prejudices, right? preconceived ideas so that we can understand other people as individuals. And I think if we can do that, your intercultural communication will be much more rewarding and much more successful. And so that brings me to the end of my presentation. And I'm going to open the time up now if anybody would like to talk to me or if anybody has any questions or thoughts, I'd be happy to, to try to answer them. So Marlene, I'm going to switch off my PowerPoint now. Okay. okay. Thank you, Sir Hubert. Go. All right. All right. Okay. So if you have any question, you can just ask now. I hope I didn't put you to sleep. <laughs> And if I did put you to sleep, I hope you had sweet dreams. Indeed. <laughs> Not nightmares, right? <laughs> Not some intercultural nightmare. Okay. Anybody? Any anything? No, no pressure. I don't want to put any pressure on you. And if you want to ask the question in Indonesian, you're welcome to do that from my perspective. Okay. I don't know from Professor Marlene's perspective whether she will be happy with that, but I'm happy to, to listen and I will try to answer to the best of my ability. Okay, that's nice. There's an opportunity for you to ask in Indonesian. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, do you have any question, everyone? Kathleen, I thought you have a question. Where's Kathleen? Kathleen Melissa. Yes, ma'am. Kathleen, yeah. So I have a question. Just let me find you first, Kathleen. Where are, can you? Kathleen, where are you? Uh, my question is. Kathleen, can, can you please raise your hand? Mr. Sir Hebert wants to see you. I, 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 raise your hand. Oh, there we Oh, that's Marlene. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen, can you wave to me? Just wave, Kathleen. Wave with your hand. Oh, in here, sir. <laughs> oh, okay, there we go. That's good. Thank you, Marlene. Okay, hi, Kathleen. Uh, my question is, what if people who only know one language, like Indonesian, can they travel abroad without knowing their language and without knowing about their culture? Wow, that's a good question. Um, you know, language is an integral part of, of culture, right? Uh, it's one of the fundamentals, one of the basic things that we have uh, in, in um, hu human, uh, uh, what is it, universals, right? One of the human universals was language. And um, um, let, me, let me look at your, your question from two, two sides, okay? Can you travel with only knowing Indonesian? Yes, you can, but it will be difficult, right? It will be difficult, but you can. Um, it would all. It would, of course, be better to know one 
uh, of what we call maybe internet more uh, international languages. And when I say that, I don't only mean English. Okay, it could be Spanish, you know, it could be Chinese. Um, but knowing at least one language that other people probably also know, or at least somewhat familiar with, right? So that would help you, okay? So what I'm saying is if you're going to go to Germany, right? You wanna to go to Germany, but you don't speak German, all right? Knowing English will help you, right? If you go to Singapore, but you don't know English, Chinese, Mandarin, I guess, Can Cantonese, will probably help you, right? At least Chinese. Um, now, going back to language and culture, I want to share with you something that I have experienced, okay? If you really want to understand a culture, uh, the deep levels of a culture, you would be very wise to learn the language of that culture, okay? Um, I, looking back on my experience in Indonesia, um, my motivations to learn English, to learn Indonesia, of course, were, were, were different. Um, I, I wanted to communicate with my sweetheart, right? Uh, and my sweetheart's family who could not speak English, okay? And so I did have uh, motivations there that were different. But if you understand the language, you will understand deeper levels of that culture, okay? Uh, that are not available to people who do not understand that language. You will understand the differences between humors, you know, humor, cynicism, uh, criticism. You will you will understand so much more about that language, about that culture, if you immerse yourself and you really, really understand the language. So, if you are wanting to to really integrate, or sorry, if you're wanting to have a very positive cross-cultural experience or intercultural experience uh, with somebody, knowing their language will be a great benefit. Okay, great benefit. And will help you immensely uh, and avoid a lot of miscommunication. So um, now I know that's not always possible, right? Uh, but that would be the ideal. The ideal would be to, to know that language. And remember that in the world today, for many, many people, English has become, uh, I would, it's not, not the first language, but a definite strong second language, okay, which in many, many cases rivals the first language the way they know it, the way they've mastered it, okay? Um, so uh, you won't go wrong learning English, okay? <laughs> you will never go wrong learning English. It will be, a, it's an investment for the future, your future. You know what an investment is? It's like tanam modal, right? You know, and itu akan berbunga nanti, besok besok, in many ways, many ways, right? Okay, thank you for your question, Christine. Am I? Any, any more question? Ma'am. Ma'am. Yes. Somebody came on and then went off. <laughs> Nia, uh, Desti or Nia? Desti? Uh, there we go. Oh, okay. Uh, my question is, in your opinion, what is the most likely um, to be the biggest problem in intercultural communication and how to solve it? Thank you. Okay. What is your name? 
Lesti, sir. Lesti? Um, <laughs> the biggest problem is ignorance. Okay. Ignorance. Um, not being sensitive. Yeah. Tida, tida paka, right? You're not sensitive to that person's culture, right? You're not, you're not sensitive. So in other words, if you do not take the time to to do your homework, right? In other words, when I say to do your homework, is to to find out as much as you can about that person, about the generalities of that person's culture, all right? As I said, and then you treat that person as an individual, okay? If you are unwilling to do that and you come to the, to the communication from a position of ignorance, that will not help you. Another thing that is very dangerous is to come to the international communication event from a position of superiority. So in other words, you have a feeling that you're better or that person is not as good as you, right? Or their culture is not as good as yours or your culture is better than this. That is a, an attitude of what? superiority right and that will definitely be a hindrance to uh, cross-cultural communication and understanding so you don't want to have preconceived ideas right prejudice prejudices right so yeah so you know i would say make sure that you know your prejudices yeah suppress those prejudices you know, to the best of your ability, understand or learn about that person's culture, and then have a humble attitude, right? A humble attitude when you uh, are interacting with that person. In other words, an attitude where you are learning. You're a learner, right? You're wanting to learn. And the person you're communicating will pick up on those things. They will say, oh, okay, this person is trying, trying to learn. And then they will be more inclined to um, engage with you more in a positive way. So I, I hope those few thoughts may help you. Any more question? Yeah, got him. Okay, go on. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you for the. Um, chance. Yes, My yes. name is Niagara, Niagara. and uh, my question, I interest with your presentation in the beginning uh, that said that to build trust in our audience, in our communication, we have to communicate lovingly and be love lovable person. Right, right. Uh, in my opinion, a lovable, lovable person and communicate lovingly is person who only speak politely and do not hurt the listener or audience. Uh -huh. um, so my question, uh, are only, eh, how does lovable person look like? Um, oh, okay. Can you give the example? Uh, and are only speak politely and don't hurting listener is the uh, lovable person. Can you explain more specific, sir? Thank you. Sure. Uh, definitely. Those are characteristics of a person who is loving and lovable, right? A person who is uh, um, uh, respectful, right? And doesn't hurt other people, right? Those are, those are some uh, of the characteristics. Um, you know, um, when I talk about loving other people, all right, when you, when you talk about loving, um, when you talk about um, being a loving and lovable person, if you are going to be a loving person, you 
you empathize with somebody else, right? You sympathize with somebody else. You put yourself in their position, okay? Um, you listen. You listen carefully, right? You don't judge them. You don't judge them, right? You are patient, right? Um, you... Um, um, you do not um, speak in a in a way that may be confrontational. Okay, um, you are always trying to to um, uh, be sensitive to that person. So there are you know being a loving being a person who is loving. Um, is, you know, I don't know if you, if you think of the fruit of the spirit, right? You know, um, that is what it means to be loving, right? And uh, so to be helpful, to be thoughtful, to be considerate, okay? Um, so, you know, there, there are many things that you can do to be a loving person. Now, what do I mean by lovable? lovable person. In other words, you want other people to see you as a, you know, uh, a person who is open, willing to, to um, uh, listen to their uh, concerns, their questions, their, their uh, inquiries, perhaps. Um, and, uh, you're not impatient with them, right? So that makes you more lovable, right? And uh, people feel more comfortable uh, addressing you, engaging with you, because they see you as um, um, more willing to, to listen, more willing to be patient and sensitive. Um, you're not aggressive, right? You're not aggressive. You are not uh, offended easily, right? You don't take offense. If somebody maybe says something that you felt maybe hurt you a little bit, right? You don't react in a negative way, right? You wait, right? So, you know, that, that attitude um, will help the the communication go smoother in my opinion okay it will make it go smoother right um, I don't know if that answers your question yes sir yeah. thank you sir you're welcome is that clear enough uh, Nia yes ma'am thank you yeah I'll think a little bit more about that maybe put together some characteristics that are that will will um, reflect a loving and a lovable person. I think that will be a good good activity. Anybody else? Any more question? Anybody? So I think no more question. If you suddenly have a thought to ask question, please save your question for next week. <laughs> because, all right. So once again, thank you very much, Sir, um, Sir oh, Hibbert, for today. It has been a pleasure. And <laughs> um, I just want to let your students know that don't worry, there's going to be no test from me. <laughs> I cannot speak for your teacher, but there's no test, okay? <laughs> so relax. relax. Okay. Um, so, it is, you know, it is so special for me to uh, have this opportunity. Um, you know, I'm kind of an alumni of, uh, of UNAI. Um, if, you, if you were there for two years, they say you're an alumni, right? And my <laughs> wife graduated from UNAI. Um, 
you know, in I I I still vividly remember my first trip from uh, Jakarta to Bandung on the train, uh, winding up that uh, what was it Bogor and the scenery was so spectacular. I, you know, I don't know. Have you traveled by train to Jakarta or back from Jakarta? It is so beautiful. I don't know if it's still like that today, but it was just wonderful at that time. And I remember that. And then the trip from Bandung to Chisarua mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Lembang and <laughs> Ledeng. And Ledeng. <laughs> Yes, it is. Ledeng. <laughs> that road was something else. My, my, my. It took us so long. The holes in the road were so big. The road was so narrow. It was, it was quite an event. And uh, we used to travel in the, uh, what we used to call oplets. Um, they were those old uh, cars from the 19... 40s or 30s after the world war <laughs> and, uh, it was it was amazing i remember the uh, the i if i sat in front the gas tank would be a jerry can and then <laughs> a, a tube going into the engine from the jerry can in the front seat and it was it was something else and there was always room for one more <laughs> up, to now, up to now sir <laughs> up to now okay well that's a cultural trait right that's a cultural value always room for one more including the chickens and all the other animals uh, but it was such a beautiful experience and i used to love to stop at i think it was leading right it was leading yeah that's yeah. where the the, like a terminal was. Yes, it is. Uh... It changed. And I remember I used to go to the little warungs and eat, drink escopior. Yeah. And also I was introduced to uh, avocado, sweet avocado in juice, avocado juice, right? With chocolate swirl in it, right? <laughs> that, oh my. Because in my culture, in my country, we never ate avocado with sugar. It was always with salt. But I learned quickly how pleasant and tasty uh, avocado is with uh, um, sugar and uh, chocolate. It was, that was wonderful. Um, so yeah, I have so many precious memories. In fact, when I went to uh, Unai, for the first time, it wasn't Unai, it was Itka. It was Itka. It was, um, uh, I still remember the, the sign in the front of the, uh, of the uh, school was Itka. And um, was it Itka? Yeah, Itka. Yeah, Itka. Itka. Yeah. And then while I was there, Itka became Unai. And so I also I saw the old sign and I saw the new sign, and uh, but of course, Unai was a very different place back then. Very different place, and it was a lot colder. It is. It was a lot colder in those days. Well, I'd like to say thank you and sampai jumpa minggu depan. Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Don't forget to remind me of the exact date. <laughs> okay, I'll be. <feel. laughs> okay, thank you so much, students. God bless you all. Keep safe and have a wonderful weekend and a blessed Sabbath. God bless you all. Marlene, thank you. Yes, thank you, everyone. We are not going to have a post prayer. That's okay. Uh, okay would you like to say something? Okay. Would you like uh, to close with prayer? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Sure. Shall we close with prayer? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is with great joy that we come before you this uh, today. 
Um, we thank you for the advances in technology that have made it possible for us to have this Zoom class. Lord, I thank you for each one of these young people who are striving to, to get an education, a Christian education. And I pray that you'll bless them in their efforts. Give them success, Lord. Help them to, be, to persevere and to find, um, uh, achieve their goals, Lord. We pray that you'll help them to be able to um, live the life that you desire them to live. We also want to pray for Unai. We pray that you'll bless the university in many, many different ways, Lord, that will help uh, grow the school so it can be a beacon of light in Indonesia. We also pray for uh, Teacher Marlene, Marlene, Lord. We pray that you'll bless her in her ministry, her teaching ministry. We pray that you'll give her wisdom and understanding at all times as she deals with young people. And we pray that you'll bless each one of us and keep us safe until we meet again next week. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Forgive us for our sins, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank okay. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye for now.